to look this morning at the first three verses of John chapter 14. It's a marvellous chapter and of course there's a great deal here we're very familiar with. These are passages that almost every Christian knows and loves and that makes it even a greater challenge to and understand them. But let me begin with the children first of all. Samuel and Emily, I'd like to teach you a new word this morning. Are you listening? I'd like to teach you a new word, and this is what it is. Maranatha. Could you try and say that with me? Maranatha. Maranatha. It's a strange word, isn't it? But it is one that appears at least once in the King James Version of the Bible. Maranatha. M-A-R-A. Can you spell the rest of it? Maranatha. It's hard work having to think in lowercase letters for the children. Mar- but, but now you're asking, why is he telling you this strange word called Maranatha? What's going on this morning? Well, I want to tell you what it means. It's a simple phrase, and it means our Lord comes, or our, our Lord is coming. I'd like you to think a wee bit further, Samuel and Emily. When you see somebody going away, what do you say to them? You say, bye-bye, goodbye, see you soon. That's more for adults, isn't it? Mummy or daddy are going somewhere, and you say, bye. And, and that means, no, we're going to miss you, and we hope you come back soon. Well, I'm told that in the church, when it first began, Christians would actually say Maranatha when people went away. That was how they would talk to each other. Instead of saying goodbye... They would say, Maranatha. Do you remember what it means? Our Lord comes. It was a very important statement. And what I'm going to try and do this morning with the adults is to show them why that that might be a good statement for us to pick up on. I'm not suggesting we all start Maranatha, but it might be useful to have in our thoughts and our minds that while people in this world say goodbye to those that they love, The one that Christians love most above everybody else. We don't say goodbye to him. We just remember he's coming back. We just remember that one day there's going to be an incredible noise in the heavens. And everybody that's a Christian is going to suddenly find himself taken from this world to meet him. And to meet him in the air and come back to the earth. But I'm running ahead of himself. What was that strange word? You remember? Maranatha. Maranatha. Maybe you could try and write it down. Or you could think of another word that would say similar things. Christians, dear friends, are to be ready for the last moment, whether it be when Christ returns in glory or where Christ returns for us personally. We have to be ready. And one way to be ready is to be always reminded that he is coming back. Why would I pick up such a theme? Because that's where John chapter 14 begins. And it's actually where it ends again, as I was reading it to you this morning. The Lord Jesus comforts his disciples in the face of life's greatest challenge, death itself, with a reminder that while he must go away, it's not permanent. He's coming back again. He will return. And that that should, in fact, influence every day of our life. That we should be asking the question of, is this the day that he comes? And not just living, presuming we're going to get old like me. The Lord himself is coming again. And I make no apology for bringing it to you because it's right here in your Bible. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These are incredible words. They're worthy of our time and our study this morning. I want to do that under three headings. First of all, he's calling us to believe him. He's calling for us to live by faith. 
He's calling us to remember that even while we can't see him, he's working for us. And finally, he's calling us to realize that he is coming. And he's coming for us, for those who are his people. And what a day that will be. We begin then with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is a call to faith. And you need to put it into the context. They've just eaten the Passover. They've seen it transformed into the Lord's Supper. And at the very heart of this new covenant is to be the sacrifice of the one that they love and delight in most especially in all the world. The one that they've been following for three years has been telling them regularly that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to die. Well, here's the bad news. It's happening. This is the moment in time when everything he's talked about becomes a reality. As I studied it, I felt the need to, to, to enter into what might be the heart and the mind of those who were listening to them. Judas has left. The 11 of them are still there around this table as they eat the Lord's Supper, as they have celebrated Passover. You would notice at the end of chapter 14, he says, let's arise and go. So it's all happening while they're still in the upper room. Before they step out to, walk, to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is speaking to them because he knows that he must die. And he understands what a hardship death is for us as human beings and what a difficulty his death will be for them to handle, to cope with and to manage. I think it would be very hard to understand the turmoil in his mind. We sort of live in a, in a world where we deny the reality of death. But when it intrudes into our life, it comes in, so it seems, with a heavy hand. And most of you have experienced it. Somebody you love is suddenly snatched out of your presence. And it seems to pull the bottom out of your stomach. It seems to live, leave you, as they say, gutted. You never get over it. You do learn to live with it, but you never get over it. And it only takes something like this to, to bring you back to the loss of that loved one, the loss of that friend. These people are being prepared for the loss, not only of their friend, but this one who is the very hope of Israel, the very confidence of the people of God, the one that they believe Israel were looking forward to. Why is he going to die? And the Lord Jesus says, trust me. He's asking them as he asks us to believe that death is under God's control. The circumstances can sometimes be absolutely tragic, but they're never out of God's control. And therefore we can find grace there. Learn from these words, and you probably will find grace when you have to face it in your family, in your loved ones, in your neighbors, in your place of work. Because the finality of death is always knocking on our doors. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And that brings us immediately to a challenge, you see. Am I trusting God for this great and awesome event? happens in my life are these disciples able now because of their experience of Jesus because of what they've heard him say because of what they've seen him do are they able to cope with and manage the, the terror that's going to be with them just in a few hours time sometimes people are told that there's no more the doctor can do and that's a, that's a horrendous experience, surely. When the doctor literally sends you home with the awful news that in a few days or a few weeks, at the conference yesterday we were hearing of a young mother in Murfield Church, and the doctors have told her there's no more we can do. She has two little children and a husband. How do you respond to, to such horrendous circumstances? 
well, you could become hardened and indifferent like the world around you, pretend it doesn't matter, pretend it doesn't happen, but the fact is it does. And death should always shock us. Death should always make us cringe because it's unnatural. We were designed to live, not to die. We die because of sin. And of course, that's exactly why Jesus is going to die. Not his own sin, but yours and mine. So that you and I, though we might go through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall never be overwhelmed by it because we know the one who's conquered it come back and is coming back. We really do need to see what's happening here and to understand the nature of the words that the Saviour is using. Look at them again. Let not your heart be troubled. First thing to notice here is a command. It's an order from heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. And if you could see the Greek, you would see that the Greek tense would indicate that something is oppressing them from the outside. They're feeling the weight of this. And it's already happening in their midst against the, the, the Greek language shows it so clearly that this is not something that's going to happen. This is something that's going on. It's right in their very midst. And the Savior looks at them, and out of love for them, he addresses the one issue nobody likes to talk about. Let not your heart be troubled. What's the heart? In the Bible, it's not that muscle that pumps blood around your body. In the Bible, in an ancient language, it's you on the inside. It's where your emotions are found. It's where your thinking is done. They didn't understand the, the place and the function of the brain. It, it, it's the heart that's seen as being the whole of the inner man. And of course that was seen in, in, in the Lord's command to Israel and through Jesus to us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart with all our soul and with all our strength. And so by speaking to them, the Savior is identifying this great truth that there is great trouble going on inside them. What's really interesting is that he was also experiencing trouble. But instead of dwelling upon his own troubles, he's looking to his followers and saying, I, I, my love for you is such as that I want to show you how to cope with what's happening. The word troubled means to be stirred up, to be agitated, to be possessed by fear. And it's the very word that's used over and over to describe how Jesus feels like on the inside. John chapter 11, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. Do you remember? That was Lazarus' death. It is great comfort to remember that our Saviour was tempted in all ways such as we are. He's experienced everything you can experience. And here, as they face trouble because of impending death, he's, he's the one who himself has felt those troubles. John chapter 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Chapter 13, 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. So he's not standing as some sort of uh, distant, uh, unemotional, unattached individual who has no troubles. He, he's, he's coming alongside his disciples as one who really understands the pain. And he's instructing them not to allow the pain to overwhelm them, not to allow the circumstances to crush them. In their minds, they'd be puzzled by what was going on. He said he's leaving. They've seen Judas go. He's, he's told them that Peter is going to deny them, deny him. They, 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 they may well imagine that their own lives are on the line. But it's not a form of stoicism. It's not an instruction which just says pretend it's not happening. It's one from one who knows this pain and knows the solution to this pain. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
Here, dear friends, is Jesus' divine teaching on how to cope with earth's greatest monstrosity. Trust God. Be a man or woman of faith. This is the only remedy. It's the only way of understanding what's going on in the world. In the Greek language, the, the words, believe, you believe in God, believe also in me, have, are, are in a, a format which makes it difficult to understand which tense they are. The, the spelling in Greek is the same for what's called the imperative and the indicative. Imperative is a command. Indicative is just a description of what's <coughs> going on. So you can, in fact, translate these words four ways. As a command, believe in God, believe also in me. As an exhortation, you believe in God as we have, believe also in me. Or, believe God, you believe in me. I've missed one out, I can't remember which one it is, but you can do the math yourself. There are four different computations of how you order it. But whether you can understand exactly what the computation is, it comes back to the very same thing. The way to face death and tragedy is through depending upon God, even when you can't understand what's going on. The world cries, why does God allow this? The Christian says, I don't know either, but I do know God. I know he's good. I know he's gracious. I know that his purposes are eternally for my good and for his glory. And therefore, while I may have to face tragic circumstances and even great pain in my life, I can believe that these things will work out to that end. It's interesting, at the end of chapter 14 and verse 27, the Saviour says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, this is an assertion that that through Jesus Christ it's possible to face the monster and to see your way through it. Understand the challenge. This is not simple. This is not a simplistic pretend it's not happening ethos. These men have seen the Lord of glory raise the dead. These men have heard them speak to the wind and the storm and they've watched it cease to happen. These men have experienced him taking bits of bread and fish and feeding 5,000 and then 4,000. But have they really come to the point where they believe he's God? Because one of the things the structure of the language does in verse 14 is it makes it very clear that he's claiming to be God. He's putting himself on absolutely the same level as God. What you do with God, the Father, do with me. And of course that would fit in with the theme of the book of John's Gospel. All the way through it's been teaching us who Jesus is and why he's to be trusted over and above the world around him. The disciples struggled. And I don't think they came to a place of peace at this point. Even after the resurrection, you find the Lord of glory meeting them on the road to Emmaus, or two of them on the road to Emmaus, and they're deeply troubled. And and when he asks them what they're troubled about, he says, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since it happened. You see, the negativity of, of watching the crucifixion had crushed their souls. Those ladies went to the tomb expecting to find a body there. Normally speaking, nobody comes back to life again. When you're dead, you're dead. But of course we know the gospel, don't we? On the third day he was not there. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? Is that lovely message from the angels. He is not here because his body's been hijacked. Because you've got the wrong place. Because actually he didn't die and he woke up. No. Those were the sort of pathetic answers the unbelieving world gave. He is not here. He is risen as he told you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Death is not the last word from God. 
has been conquered. And we have the testimony of the scripture that that is the case. And so as the disciples face death, as you and I face death, you and I are called to, to assert and affirm our confidence in the God who has made us, the God who gave Christ for us, the God who raised them from the dead. In a sense, we're in a better position than the disciples because we've seen the last chapter. They were facing it as it was happening. They hadn't realized what was going to happen. We, dear friends, have got 2,000 years of history. Piles of evidence to show that Jesus most certainly came back from the dead. People have tried to disprove it again and again, and they've been converted in the process. Read Frank Morrison's book, Who Moved the Stone? It's not, not my purpose to preach a, a, an Easter Sunday sermon today, but uh, read those kind of books and you will see how, how this great truth stands the test of time. It's why there are Christian churches. And so when you and I face the monster, you need to have in your mind and your heart that death is merely a door through which we pass from time to eternity. And for the Christian, there's a glorious hope on the other side. We'll come to that in just a minute. I don't want to run ahead of it myself. But ask yourself, dear friend, think back to the last time you had to face death. As you get older, it happens more often. As a minister, I take funerals, and, and, and they're wretchedly sorrowful occasions in one sense. But a Christian funeral is, 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 is almost like a revival meeting. Because we know it's just the beginning of forever. We need to read these words and allow them to instruct us. I hope you know who Jan Hus is. He's a reformer just before Martin Luther in the country we call Czechoslovakia. And as a preacher of the gospel, he ran up against the authorities of the church. And they sentenced him to death for being a heretic. It's said in the book I read yesterday that Jan Hus, knowing that he was going to be burned alive, would deliberately put his hand into the flame of a candle. And when asked what he was doing, he says he was just getting ready for the pain that he was going to experience when they tied him to the stake. You and I need to look at death. I'm not aware that any of you are facing that monster right now. So it's at times like this we need to look and say, I must make a note here. Because the best way for me to handle what most certainly is coming somewhere soon maybe, or has happened in recent history, is to put my confidence in the God who conquered it. You see, the Lord Jesus went to Calvary deliberately and purposefully to bring about redemption. Look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. You see, facing his own death, the Saviour seeks to comfort the disciples with knowledge about their own end. Because surely the question that would be uppermost in their mind, both on a, a, a physical level and on a spiritual level, is what's going to happen if that's what happens? What, how are we going to cope with this the day after and the day after that? Now again, modern man pretends that somehow it will never happen. I'm going to a 90th birthday party on Friday. One of my aunts who boxed my ear when I was a little one reaches 90 years old on Friday. And that's tremendous and we love to see people having long lives but let's beware and, uh, and realize it's the exception. It's the exception. And I hope you all live as long as the longest on the planet, but I do know that you won't live here forever. You're moving on one day, and you need to be ready. 
How can I be ready? By having the question answered, what happens next? Where do I go from here? These are the questions that men and women wrestle with. And Jesus makes it very clear that his death is intricately linked to what happens to people afterwards. Him being in the world at that time and being God is evidence that there is a world beyond this. I can't understand people who, who, who don't believe that there is in fact a, a life beyond this life. It's crazy. There's just so much evidence around us and especially in the person of Jesus Christ and in the word of God. But it's not academic. How does it affect me? It affects me well when I realize the Savior has gone to prepare a place for me. Jesus giving himself as the new covenant sacrifice will open heaven to men and women who deserve eternal death. Because by his sacrifice on the cross, a contract will be made between him and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit for the deliverance of those who deserve to be crushed into God's eternal presence. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's why it's good news. It doesn't just make us better citizens. It gives us a glorious hope, a great future. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again, says Peter, to a living hope. I'm not waiting to see what will happen. I know what's going to happen because Jesus tells me here and many other places in the scripture. While I would be excluded by my sin and guilt, he has gone to prepare a place for me. He has gone to prepare a place for me in his father's house where there are many mansions. Now these are words that conjure strange things to our mind, isn't it? You have to do a wee bit of theology before you unpack this verse. Does God live in just one place? No. God is a spirit. God is universally present. God is all-powerful. So immediately when you remember that who God is and that he's not confined to one place, when you read verses like this, you know it's analogy, it's picture. no guarantee here of a five bedroom house with pillars outside for you waiting somewhere up in the sky that's just the natural mind missing, missing the point of what's actually in the text but what you do have here most clearly stated is that when we pass from this world and we pass trusting Jesus we enter into a state of being in the presence of God and in a state of happiness and comfort The Bible often looks on us with pity as God uses it to explain to us, to our little heads, what the future's like. And it talks about where God dwells as being his dwelling place. You'll find it in the Psalms 33, 14. From the place of his dwelling, he looks down on the inhabitants of earth. It's a nice picture. You can, get, you can, you can handle that, can't you? It's, it's God pandering to, to our limits. He wants us to understand that what waits for us is far more glorious than anything we've experienced. The language would seem to be picking up on the, the, the Jewish teaching on what the temple was. You remember that the, the temple in the Jewish mind, like the tabernacle, was God's dwelling place. Did God dwell just inside that building in the center of the t temple? Most certainly not. And I, I began by reading from Isaiah where, it, where he makes the case, you see, that the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. Some of the ladies here used to use footstools to put their feet on. I don't see any this morning. Um, but you know what a footstool is. It just sort of holds a little bit of you. And if you imagine the planet as God's footstool, that little box which you raise your feet up on, how much more immense and great is the being that it describes? But the truth is, you see, 
when we pass from this world, that's where the believer goes, into the presence of God. I read with interest that the word mansion had a different meaning when the, it was, when the Bible was translated by Tyndale into English. It just meant somewhere to live. It's not the places that the stars live in. It's just an ordinary house, an ordinary place. It's the English language that's changed it, but it's a very roomy place. It's a place with many mansions. If you could have visited the temple in ancient times, you would have found many rooms attached round the outside of it. But the priests changed, and some of them lived, and things were stored. The picture seems to be one that the, he's drawing this out, and you get that further developed at the end of the book of Revelation, don't you? Where the, the God is seen as a city coming down from the heavens for us to dwell in. All the time, the pictures are seeming are trying to, to, to latch us on to things that are real for us so that we can begin to imagine what this other world is like. Apparently in society at that time, when children grew up and got married, they didn't go away and live in a separate house. What they did was they built a bit on to their parents' house. And that's another picture that's in this language here, you see. So there's to be a place... In the Father's presence, where we're all going to stay. And look at the words Jesus uses. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I read that and I thought, wow. Did he actually see that somebody listening was saying, yeah, you're joking. Could never be. Maybe there was nobody there, but maybe there's somebody here this morning thinking like that. Interesting stuff, but yeah. We can't be sure. We can. We are. Because this is Jesus talking. Never told a lie all his days. He's the son of the God who cannot lie. This word is better than gold in the bank. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is facing death. The disciples must face his death. Why is it necessary for him to go? Because as sinners, you and I can't go into God's presence without coming under judgment. Jesus has to deal with that which would bring God's anger and wrath upon us. I go to prepare a place for you. He's not going to build it. He's going to open the door so you can go in. He's going to deal with your sin and with mine, which stops us from being in God's presence and enjoying it. I go to prepare a place for you. And he did that by dying on the cross. His body was battered and bruised, as you and I deserve to be because of our sin. His blood, his life was taken and offered in the heavenly temple. Hebrews 9.23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I go to prepare a place for you. So that now at God's right hand, there is a Savior who bears the marks of our sin. Now at God's right hand, there's a Savior whose blood has covered over our iniquity and made us righteous. Now at God's right hand, there is one who ever lives to make intercession for us. The enemy comes and accuses us. We've got a defense lawyer with a father, an advocate, 1 John chapter 2. That's what my Savior has done. And that's how he comforts his disciples. And that's how you and I should be comforted. I've had the privilege of conducting a couple of Christian funerals in the last year. Notice I said the privilege. It's an awesome, awesome job. But you can't get away from the fact that while we feel the pain of loss of a loved one, when you know that they've gone into Jesus' presence, there is immense, incredible comfort and peace in it. Oh, you'll know that they weren't perfect, but you'll understand that if they were trusting in Jesus Christ, he had made them perfect through his sacrifice. And now being accepted in the beloved, they enter into God's presence. 
And so while you're separated for a while, it's not permanent. While they're enjoying the Lord's glory, all you've got is this ball of dirt. But one day, you'll be with them. One day, you'll rejoice with them also if you're in Christ. That, dear friends, is the Christian's hope and confidence. And you need to just dust it off and see whether you're still hoping and confident in these things. Are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe he died for you? Have you confessed him as Lord? Then as far as human beings can tell, you've got a place of glory. I've got an old chorus rattling through my head. It's amazing how they happen. I've got a place in glory that outshines the sun. I've got a place in glory that outshines the sun. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. But it's got my name on it. An inheritance reserved in heaven for you who are kept. You know where to find that. First Peter chapter 1 verses 5 I think it is or 4. Reserved. In heaven. That's, that's a good thing if it's reserved. In, but I'm sure of getting there. Read Peter. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept. And it can never be destroyed. I can't remember the exact words Peter uses. But he lists rust and moths. And all these sort of things. That, that, that corrupt things in this world. If you're not a believer. I need to be very frank with you. Your future is hopeless disastrous it's diabolical and that's probably a good word because you're going to spend forever with the devil how do you respond you believe in God some of you do, you're religious you wouldn't be here otherwise believe also in me cast your lot in with Jesus you'll find a place in glory oh oh, oh, man time races on I need to get this last point in he's coming back for us that's what he told them I'm going away but I'm coming back where is it verse 3 if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also this is our great and ultimate comfort He is talking ultimately of what will happen at the end of the age when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and will be caught up in the air together with the saints who are alive to meet the Lord in the air. But in actual fact, I believe he's talking about more than the end of the world. Because as we read through chapter 14, you would have noticed the promise that he was going to come to them while they were still on the earth as well. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so you have the the, the ultimate promise of Christ returning and us being ushered into glory of the new heaven and the new earth. But he doesn't sort of leave us waiting to find out. He actually reveals himself to us in life. And my books were very helpful at this point because they, they, they explained, you see, that he did come back from the dead on the third day, didn't he? And the people who thought death was the end were suddenly transformed. You couldn't shut them up. You couldn't stop them. You could put them in prison. You could kill their friends. But they just kept on telling the world, we've seen Jesus. He died for our sins. He rose again on the third day. Whoever believes on him has everlasting life and has the hope of glory. And having ascended on high, he poured out his spirit. Remember our God is a triune God, Father, Son and Spirit. To have any one part of God is to have all of him. And then you go back into these verses. I'm looking forward to preaching them. Um, Somebody's turned the page. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. This is the glory of being a Christian. We've not simply adopted a philosophy, a creed. We've experienced a saviour. A saviour who died for us. Who has prepared heaven for us. And who has come into our lives so that we know we are forgiven. So that we know we've been made holy. So that we know that we have the privilege of being called sons and daughters of God. As a foretaste 
of what's going to happen at the end of the ages. Of what's going to happen at the end of time. <coughs> He's coming back. He's coming back for his own people. He's coming back for the unbeliever, the day of judgment. You've got to go to Matthew 24 or 25 to see there the separation of the goat and the sheep and the judge. But he's coming back as a saviour for his people. To receive us to himself. To take us into glory. And, and, and the great good news is we don't deserve it. But it's ours. And that then becomes the foundation and the basis for wanting to tell the world. then becomes a great reason to draw alongside people who are grieving and to seek to get their eyes off the pain and to look to the future but as I say I realise you see sometimes we have to grieve over unbelievers and that's that has to be one of life's greatest pains when somebody you love dies and you know they're not with Christ, it, it, it's painful to even think where they are. And you who are here this morning and not yet in Christ, please don't add to our pain. Please don't add to the pain of God's people. Come to Christ today before he comes back and the, the free offer of the gospel is cancelled. Repent, believe, flee from the wrath to come. Come on, what's holding you back? Look at the <coughs> promise of Jesus here. I will come again and receive you to myself. We're going to be where he is. One of the mysteries of the passage is he doesn't give us a lot of, 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 of vain details, does he? Because as the hymn writer says, where Jesus is, there's heaven there. <coughs> To be in his presence. <coughs> Not simply in some mystical world beyond this where we float about without bodies. But ultimately and finally when the heavens and earth are recycled and we are given this whole universe to enjoy forever. I really can't understand why everybody doesn't want that. Except I also know <coughs> the devil... You'll pack your head full of lies, questions and doubts. And as long as you keep listening to him, you'll be lost. <coughs> Ultimately, Jesus is coming back. As I was preparing this, you know, I pray as I prepare and, and God gives me things into my mind. An old song came to mind. And I'm going to finish with that. Remember Maranatha, you youngsters, he's coming. But Sir Harry Lauder, I don't know how popular he was in England. But where I was brought up, he was a familiar character on, 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 the, on the radio. Sir Harry Lauder sang during the wartime, didn't he? And one of his songs was absolutely appropriate to finish with. Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end. Though the way be long, let your heart be strong. Keep right on round the bend. Though you're tired and weary, still journey on till you come to your happy abode. Where all the love you've been dreaming of will be there at the end of the road. Where all the love that you've been dreaming of. Do you dream about going to be with Jesus? Paul says, I can't tell you which to choose. He says, I don't know which is better, to stay here with you or to <coughs> depart and be with Christ. He obviously <coughs> dreamt about being with Jesus. What a glorious future. And what a comfort as we face life's tragedies and difficulties. Amen.